Hello and welcome to At Issue. I'm H. Wayne Wilson. It's not often that we have athletes gathered around this table, but that is indeed the case for this program. Uh, yes, we're going to talk about athletic accomplishments, but we're all go also going to talk about coming together as a team, coming together as a group of young men. And let me introduce you to some very special people on At Issue. Let me welcome Mike Haynes. Mike is um, or I should say was the, the, <laughs> the goalkeeper. The, and and we'll, we'll talk about, you know, you're no longer on the Bradley team. All right, all right. The Bradley soccer team, uh, you're the goalkeeper. Um, second team, uh, all Missouri Valley. Uh, goals against uh, average of 1.00, a remarkable record. Thank you for being on that issue. Thank you. His coach, Jim DeRose. Uh, Jim has been coached since 1996 at Bradley and um, coach of the year according to uh, Soccer America, so congratulations. Thank you very much. And uh, a defender for the team, and we'll talk a little bit about why he was the defender on the team, but uh, we welcome Teddy Anderson. Uh, Teddy uh, was uh, also uh, received Missouri Valley Conference uh, recognition, and you were the most valuable player in the MVC tournament. Yes, so thanks please. for having me. Um, we have to start, of course, with um, the tragedy, mm -hmm. August 12th. Um, Danny Dahlquist dies in a house fire. You not only lose Danny Dahlquist from the team, but you also lose three other players on the team who uh, were charged uh, with that event. How do you find out about it? What do you tell the team? What's the initial reaction? Um, I found out about it uh, the morning of Danny's passing. Uh, uh, Craig Dahlquist, who is also an assistant athletic director at Bradley University, called me and told me that his son had passed away. and, and uh, Hours that followed, uh, you know, became aware of the the events surrounding the tragedy. Um, you know, within several uh, well, half uh, hours after the tragedy, or um, that morning, we met as a team and um, we were trying to assemble all of our players because we we weren't ready to start preseason for another day or two. So our freshmen hadn't gotten in yet, and, and players were coming in, and um, we met as a team. And um, certainly, those first hours and days, we were really. Uh, uh, just providing the boys with the support services they needed, grief counseling, um, and uh, and trying to do the best we could for the Dawkins family as they uh, mourn Danny's loss in in the um, in, in the the viewing and the funeral and things like that. As players, um, you're probably sh in a state of shock in initially, but then all of a sudden you have to come to practice. Um, what are you thinking? How are you responding? Um, we were all still pretty much in shock. Um, after hearing about Danny's passing, and um, you know, we—it's uh, hard to lose a teammate, but he was a great kid and a great friend to all of us. So he meant a lot to us. So it was—it was difficult to get back on the field and start playing. Um, a lot of us still had a lot of mourning to do. Uh, you um, have been, both been on the team for four and a half years, five yeah. seasons. Um, did did you take it upon your shoulders as you were team captains? Is that correct? Did you take it upon your shoulders to say, we're the captains, we need to make sure the team holds together? Uh, <clears throat> no, I don't, I don't think it was so much that. I think it was more, um, and I know we had, me and Coach had this conversation, that we just wanted to be around each other. We didn't want to be around, you know, certainly any of the, the media or anything else. We just wanted to be uh, together, and that, you know, didn't mean, you know, playing soccer or you know, watching film or anything like that. It, it could have been just, you know, uh, you know, at a dinner or, you know, um, just in a room talking about everything that happened. As a result of that, did that bring you guys even closer? I know soccer players are very close to begin with, but did that even bring you closer together? I think being around each other and, um, I mean, as upperclassmen and captains, you have a little bit of responsibility to make sure that younger guys are you know, recouping and feeling like they can get their, f they can tell everybody how they feel. And I think you kind of have to gauge the team as upperclassmen and captains and see where people are at after the tragedy. Um, some people heal in different ways and they need different forms of healing. So I think we had to do that a little bit. But, um, but basically we all decided that we really wanted to be with each other and be around each other. And that was the best way we thought we would, we were going to heal from this. The season starts and um it was a little rough. You didn't play poorly, right. but you didn't play great. Mm -hmm. um, and then you, you kind of evolved. What, what transpired? 
You know, I, I think uh, we miss from a soccer standpoint, you miss 16 preseason practices, and we're f fortunate that we opened at home. We did get two wins right away. Um, went on the road and played the national champion, Wake, and lost, and had a good result. We tied North Carolina, but I, I believe our first five, six, seven games were nothing more than just going out and playing soccer games. Uh, we really, as a coach, I wasn't, to be very honest, I wasn't very concerned about the results as much as you know, getting people out there playing and getting them to, you know, compete, say it's okay to compete, having them, it's okay for them to, to, to smile, it's okay for them to enjoy themselves. And it, it took us, and maybe we never even got there fully, even after everything, for us to, to somewhat, you know, embrace um, competition again. And that's what those first days were. And, and then as that came along and the results followed, it, it kind of snowballed. Uh, your coach mentioned that uh, he told you it's okay to smile. That, that was tough at first. I mean, you go to practice and usually you're in the locker room and you're slapping around and, and all of a sudden you're, you're not even smiling. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I think uh, that was exactly it. There was a lot, uh, a lot less joking going on, especially um, in the beginning of the year. Um, it was more, a lot more business-like when we get uh, to the field and just, you know, excited to be there um, and, and playing, but we definitely took it as, you know, once we played soccer, that's all it was. And, there wasn't a lot of fun. More or less robotic? Yeah, a little. I mean, there's reminders of Danny all over the field and his parents in the stands. Well, you had a marking on the field yeah. for him. So, I mean, it's hard. I mean, you see those, and you really wish you could share this moment with him and this season with him. So, yeah, it was a little more businesslike and a little more, you know, question, should I be enjoying this soccer game that I used to, you know, be able to smile every second and have fun throughout the game? The, the season turns around at some point. I don't, I mean, not that there was a turning no. point, but it seemed to, I keep using the word yeah. evolve. Yeah. What happened? Yeah, because from a wins and losses standpoint, it was actually, of all my years coaching, more or less, it was actually, actually pretty, you know, we played 24, 25 games and, and we only lost six, but the losses were spread out pretty evenly, you know, one here, one there, one there, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, one of the things we talked about is we didn't goal set, we didn't, talk about conference championship even though we had won two in a row we just didn't talk about those things and you know I can't take a point and say this is when it changed because every day was just an evolution I, I really I really have a much firmer grasp on the one day at a time concept it wasn't even one game at a time it was one practice at a time um, you know it was watching them in the locker room um, I'll even say you know when we won some huge games Indiana and Maryland there was jubilation it was but you know, it was a lot more introspective. And I think maybe one of the moments that I'll just remember is, um, it had nothing to do with uh, Wake Forest, North Carolina, just being on the road after the tragedy for the first time. We were out of Peoria all together in a hotel for four days. I think that was a really good thing for us. As players, uh, did you see a, a point or was, was it just gradually that you, you started to say, we are a soccer team, we're pretty good, now we're starting to play better or was there a... Well, I, like he said, I, I don't think that there was, um, you know, a point or a game where we could say, oh, you know, after this result or after this, uh, you know, weekend, um, we were a different team. I think it was just, just constantly growing and healing and getting better. And then, like I said earlier, um, doing all that and then looking back, we accidentally won some games and, you know, we're in a position to do what we did at the end of the year. I, I might correct you on that. You didn't <laughs> accidentally <laughs> win some games, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> I think you played fairly well. <laughs> um, uh, the uh, Dahlquists are part of the Bradley family. Uh, Craig is um, in the athletic department. Uh, his wife is an English teacher, I believe. Yes. Uh, they came to almost every game, all home games, most of the away games, mm -hmm. uh, an inspiration to you guys? Without a doubt. I mean, the Dahlquist family was a blessing the whole way. I mean, after the game, if we got a win or a loss, he was there on the field. And when the game ended, we wanted to get a hug from him because they're just amazing people. I mean, Craig's, in order to get to Coach's office, you have to walk by Mr. Dahlquist's office. So, I mean, he's just one of those guys you want to stop in and say hi and see how things are going because he's just a great guy to talk to. So, I mean, it's just nice to have them there, and it's just nice to have their family at all our games. It was a blessing to have them around. Let's talk about um, a little historical perspective for the Bradley soccer program. You arrive in 1996. The soccer team's been on uh, some rough times. <laughs> and you, you start to win some games. Uh, as a matter of fact, you've won quite a few. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you elevate the team. Now, now you are 
consistently either winning or right up there in terms of the Missouri Valley. Mm -hmm. You haven't gotten to that next level. Um, this is the year you did that. Mm -hmm. um, any, anything, uh, and, and we're going to talk outside of Danny Dahlquist, okay. anything different that, that accomplished that or was it some lucky bounces or? Yeah, you, you know, um, you know we, we had lost, it's well documented, I think we had lost six conference championship matches and the, you know, we unfortunately always ran into Creighton who's, you know, like the Kansas in our league and have basketballs and they're just great teams but you know maybe going in this year we played them at their place they were number seven in the country and people were asking me oh you know God, another conference championship how do you feel and maybe silly me it was the first time ever I just I was very at peace going into that game I really because again I, I had no goals and things as a coach to do that so for me it was very important just to go play and um, you know, we won, I think won, we won that game and in the way we won it after the year before, the 4.4, now we win it with a minute left. You know, maybe for some way that's when we all started to say, hey, maybe something can happen here. And, and then kind of the rest is well documented. But, uh, you know, I never felt in any way, shape, or form about, you know, not getting over the hump or getting the monkey off your back. Uh, it makes for good media and good theater, but this season had nothing to do with uh, individual stuff. Uh Jim's reference to 4.4, um, if I recall correctly, 4.4 seconds left a year ago when mm -hmm. Creighton scores. Right. Um, um, and I, I look at Mike because he's the goalkeeper. <laughs> but, uh, right. So uh, do I. Uh, <laughs> so um, it, a little bit of, um, you were smiling at the end of that game, weren't you? Yeah. Um, it was, <clears throat> you know, it was good to do that, especially um, there. But I, the conversation we had earlier was, that we didn't use that as motivation for this year. It was, uh, you know, a great bonus at the end of the year to do that to them, you know, mm -hmm. because they had obviously done it to us. But, you know, that wasn't what, you know, we thought about this year. So you get to the NCAA tournament. You haven't won a, a right. tourney game yet. And um, you played DePaul. Yep. And you play fairly well against them. Yeah, we did. You win that game. And then you move on to two-time national champ Indiana. Seven, oh, or seven times. Seven, seven times. Time national. That, that, they, I knew they yeah. had quite a few. Right? Um, and uh, do you, when you, you're going against the, the big boys, um, so to speak. Uh, you, you've moved outside the conference now. What, what are your thoughts when you're playing Indiana? Um, basically, we knew that they're a powerhouse, and they have been for a long time in NCAA Division One. And um, you arrive at their field, and you see those <laughs> banners up there. And I mean, it, it can be a little bit of intimidate, an intimidation factor. But I think for us, Coach DeRose has always preached that, you know, as from a soccer standpoint, we can, we'll play anyone, anywhere, on any field, at any time. So, I mean, we were ready to play Indiana. I mean, I think we were ready going into that game. And we weren't really intimidated like uh, I feel like a lot of teams might have been. Uh, you won that game in a shootout? <clears throat> That's correct. Uh, at any point, did you think we've got these guys? Um. No. <laughs> you don't think that way. Um, <laughs> once the shootout started? Yeah, yeah once the shootout started. Uh, he had to face the shots. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. Nothing I can do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I was just, uh, you know, confident going into that saying, hey, you know, we've, you know, got these far and, you know, shootouts can go either way. So I think it was more, um, I don't know what the word, maybe at, at peace with the fact that, you know, if, if we do end up not coming out with a result here, we just took Indiana to a shootout on their field. So I think maybe with that, I was you know much more relaxed going into it. And the reason I bring it up is that that exact point is that it, you, you played them two two through ninety minutes. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden you're in OT. We can beat these guys, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you did. You move on to Maryland. You fall behind two nothing after the first forty five minutes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and what do you say at halftime? You know, really, at halftime for, for for that game in particular, because I think we were that way the whole year. There wasn't an incredible amount of like motivational speeches because that we were in a di much different place. But the one thing we did talk about it at Maryland was how did we want to finish the season? You know, what is our identity, and what do we hold ourselves accountable to? And I think we always say as a program we want to be, from a soccer standpoint, we want to be hardworking, we want to be organized, and we want to compete. And um, all I said is this game can finish two nothing, and if you do those three things, we can represent ourselves very well and uh, 
uh, you know, with Maryland's record, you, to, to be very candid, you just don't think you're coming back from a 2 nothing lead. You fight, you coach till the very final whistle. You compete, but the reason they were able to get the result is they did. Uh, we want to throw it around in sports, but there's a difference between playing until the final whistle and competing until the final whistle. And they competed uh, the whole way and I think had Maryland on their heels in the last 17 minutes. The game didn't start that way. Maryland played fairly well. Mm -hmm. You didn't play your best half in that first 45 minutes. Uh, Maryland's a two-time national champ. They're up 2 nothing at halftime. You come out and um, three and a half or so minutes left in the game. It's still 2 nothing Maryland, but you've played really well in the second half. Mm -hmm. Two mm -hmm. completely different halves. Um, what are you thinking uh, at that point? Well, like Coach said, we were playing uncharacteristic to a Bradley team in the first half. And, you know, at halftime, he just said, come out, play your game, play like I know you're capable of playing, and um, don't give up. And uh, nobody on this team was going to quit at any point. We weren't about to concede the match. So we just battled and competed until the final whistle and eventually ended up tying it up in regulation. You played well in the second half. You mm -hmm. didn't let any goals in, obviously. But um, you, was there a, a renewed determination after halftime? Said, well, we are going to compete in the last 45 minutes. Yeah, I mean, I knew, I knew that we wouldn't, you know, after coach came in and pretty much put it on our shoulders saying, you know, if you're going to go out, how, how are you going to go out? Are you going to go out, you know, losing this game 4 to nothing to Maryland and then people being like, oh, you know, they, you know, got lucky against Indiana and, you know, they're here or, are you gonna Are you gonna come out and compete, and then have that have Maryland walk off the field and say, you know, they they deserve to be here? Um, but you know, with you know three and a half minutes or five minutes left, I remember looking back at the clock because at Maryland the uh, student section is right behind the goal, so I can't see the clock unless I walk out outside of my box and then turn around. So every time I do that, they keep yelling at me. They say, if you want to know how much time's left, you know, we'll just tell you, but you're gonna lose. And so with three minutes left or so, I'm looking back and thinking, you know, all right, you know, we had a pretty good year, you know, we played well in the second half, but, uh, you know, it's, it's over. You, know, you, I can't, you thought I, it was over? Yeah, I definitely thought you, it was you, over. You, you were okay with the second half. The, yeah, you I was okay. Well, but right. but it's okay. over. Right. And Teddy, what are you thinking with three and a half to go? I'm, I'm thinking very similar thoughts. I mean, we're, we were very fatigued. I mean, the season went, obviously, we had a lot of emotional th issues to deal with, and a from a physical standpoint, you know, we hadn't play, had a season since I've been here that had lasted this long. So, and a lot of the guys have just played a lot of minutes. So, I mean, I'm hurting, I'm, I'm limping around the field thinking it was a great season and um, we weren't going to give up, but, but I guess, you know, it had run out. So. You're limping around the field, yet you help keep the ball in front of the net. <laughs> That's and, true. And all of a sudden the first goal is scored. You th thinking a little differently at this point now? Um, after the first one, we definitely had, there was a momentum swing. I mean, there was a momentum swing in the whole second half. I felt that like we had the better of play. The ball was in there in a lot. And um, after the first one went in, there was definitely a, a unspoken lift in the motions. And uh, there was a lot more energy that seemed to be coming, you know, from the Bradley players than the Maryland team at that point. You mentioned that unspoken lift. When, if, if a goal goes against Mike or if um, something goes wrong on the field and you, you missed a position or whatever, do you talk to each other or do you just know? I, I think, um, you know, since I've, you know, known Ted and obviously Joe since we were six years old, um, it's, it, it's unspoken. Um, if something goes wrong, you know, it could be just a little look and I know what he's thinking or it could be, you know, him yelling at me and saying, you know, some of the worst things ever. Um, but in saying that, um, you know, after that's done, you know, and then whatever, you know, whether it's, you know, yelled or just a look, after that everyone knows, you know, that's what we got to do. We're okay. Yep. It, it accomplished its point. Right. Uh, then you score again, it's tied, and you go, is that, that's a double overtime game? Yeah. And then you win three to two. Uh, what, what are you thinking at this point? <laughs> Uh, you You're know, going to the Elite Eight. Yeah, going to the Elite Eight. And, and the nice thing, we talked about early in the season, very early, no one had been through what this program had been through. I mean, you, you could probably go through the annals of, of college athletics. Um, and there's been a lot of unfortunate tragedy. But you, nothing with the complex of other players involved and the families and all of these things. And, and really the nicest thing for me was we talked at the beginning of the year, no one can lead from the front. I can't tell you I've been here as a coach. I have a responsibility to their families to try to lead them the best I can. But I can't manufacture something that I haven't been through. And so when we go to the Elite Eight, very rare is it as a coach that you can say, 
I am experiencing something for the first time with all of these people next to me. And it was so genuine, I think, that you could see, and sometimes people, one of the NCAA representatives when was walking me to the press conference and said, hey, Jim, I, it's okay to smile now. And it was funny because I had been preaching that to them, but I wasn't not happy. I was trying to put it in its perspective, in its place, because I knew I was going to be asked about it. And so that was when I, I realized we're all doing something special. We're all going to the Elite Eight. And, and that what made it so unique is this community, families, everybody got a chance to, to come along for a ride. Uh, many people are familiar with Sean Taylor dying. Yes. Um, he was killed down in Florida, a defensive back for the Washington Redskins, for those that don't know. And Washington all of a sudden started playing very well and, and made it to the playoffs. Yeah. And they had not been playing well prior to that time. Going back to your situation, mm -hmm. not exactly similar, sure. but still a loss of a player. Uh, is there, down at the core of it, is there an inspiration? We're going to do this for, in Washington's case, Sean, in your case, Danny. I think inspiration is the better. I think it's really to be really careful, and we talked about that very early on. There was... I told the players, and I don't think they wanted it, motivationally, we were never going to reference Danny's name in our locker room. And, and I don't think we did all year. We, we were never going to, from a soccer standpoint, use Danny as any source of motivation. The inspiration we have his locker permanently preserved in our locker room. It's there for all of our players to be around, to see, to take it in when they need to do it. Privately, they know how Danny lived his life and how he played soccer. You know, Danny was not... The, the greatest athletically gifted kid. But you know, in a lot of times in tragedy, people want to say he was a great guy or he was great. It's like Teddy said, he was, I mean, initially he was the little brother on this team. And you could say, I might be a better soccer player, but Danny was the hardest working player. I can say that. He worked harder at becoming a great soccer player than anybody else. And maybe I think guys took that in their mind to the field is, in their own minds, I can play the way he played, just inspiration, but motivationally never. No. Um, let's, um, let's reflect back. Uh, both of you have graduated now. Um, you're not going to play for Bradley <coughs> Soccer anymore. Um, do you appreciate what you accomplished, especially this year, but even over your, your four and a half years at Bradley? And how much are you going to miss this? And well, I, that may be an a inappropriate question because <laughs> I know the answer is yeah. you'll miss it terribly. But Yeah, well, I mean, you create a lot of bonds over the years, especially four and a half years, guys that are gone, guys that are still here, guys that are in the locker room that are going to be playing while we're gone. And um, I think we'll be able to see those guys, you know, through alumni games, but never again we'll be able to share, you know, a soccer season. And I wish I had a few years of eligibility still left, but unfortunately I don't. So uh, I think there's, it's going to be a big void to fill in my life. And, uh, you know, some of the bonds that I've created are, something I'll never, I won't trade for the world. Mike? So. Yeah, I think it, exactly what you said. I think I, I certainly won't miss, you know, three practices a day or, or 7 a.m. Um, lifts. I think what I'll miss is just, you know, being around the guys and, you know, at those 7 a.m. lifts, looking around being like, yeah, this is terrible, but at least, you know, I'm with, you know, you know 30 some odd guys and it's terrible for them too. So I think just, the bonds and the relationships that you've built is, is what I'll really miss. And it's, and it's just not the players. I mean, we have a great, right. great, probably one of the, the best in the country as far as I'm concerned, the support staffs. I mean, from the coaching staff to the new president of the university who's been just a blessing to all of us. And, you know, the athletic director and, you know, Vernette who oversees our sport. Well, as a matter of fact, wasn't it the whole coaching staff named Midwest Region uh, Coaching Missouri Staff? Missouri Valley Conference Coaching Staff of the Year, and I think that's something we put in as a, as a soccer coaching staff because you know um, when, you're, when you achieve anything, it's staff-related. And, and I think one thing that probably needs to be said here is, is, is something that just Teddy just alluded to. Um, our program, our team, has gotten a lot of um, recognition, accolades, honors, awards, whatever you want to say because of this. But, um, you know, President Glasser first day on the job was Danny's funeral. Um, she was a blessing to all of us uh, coming in, and I think there was a lot of questions. Would we even have a season? Would we, if we did have a season, would we play the first week? And she came in and met with our team and met with me, and, and um, she, uh, in a very motherly way, but with a very firm and authoritative, said, we want you to play. You, you can help this community. You can help this university, and we believe in you, and we're strong. And she stood, you know, at a time where it would have been easy to keep your distance. She not only stood by us, you know, she really cared deeply about us as father and a husband and, and sons, and my boss, Ken Cavanaugh, and all of our support staff were just beyond there for us 
they were uh, making it happen. Oh, real quickly, yep. just in the final 30 seconds, you two renewed a friendship. <laughs> you came from Florida to Bradley. You came from Dunlap to Bradley. <laughs> but you had been in Florida. You uh, had played with him yeah, um, as, a, as a child. Yeah, we, jeez, uh, moved down there. I moved down there when I was in preschool. And we ended up going to uh, grade school together, kindergarten through uh, sixth grade down in Clearwater. And then uh, I'd moved to Cincinnati and then back to Peoria. And I uh, hadn't talked to him all through high school, all four years. And then he ran into my mom at the Peoria airport. And she was like, you know, what are you doing here? He's like, well, I'm kind of looking to go into Bradley. And she was like, oh, you know, Mike kind of is too. So then we you know, got back in contact, and, and here we are. A renewed friendship that will last the rest of your life. It's true. And he's actually thinking of maybe taking a job down in my neck of the woods, so maybe it might last a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Mike Haynes, goalkeeper for Bradley University. Jim DeRose, head coach Thank of you. Bradley University soccer team. Teddy Anderson, defender. And we didn't even talk about the new position. You had to play <laughs> defender instead of forward this year. So congratulations to you on an excellent season. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being with us here on Ad Issue. Next week, we're going to be talking politics. Uh, we'll look at some legislative races right here on Ad Issue. Thanks for being with us.